speech, I'm actually going to take a time travel back to our first day um, of the second semester, January 16th, and CNN Entertainment actually posted uh, an article online that said that the Ringling Brothers Circus was going to be going out of business in May will be their last show. So I was so excited, so I forwarded the article to my sister, who lives at home, um, my hometown. And she said, oh yeah, I just read that. I'm so sad that Amelia, who is my one-year-old niece, will never be able to go to the circus. And so that was a very different uh, interpretation that I got from the article than my sister. So it made me think, you know, well, maybe other people aren't as informed or educated about what goes beyond beyond behind the scenes at the circus. And so that's why I decided to give my speech on uh, the circus. And I hope that everyone learns what sort of happens behind the scenes. Um, because over time, the circus has really transformed from what once was a simple form of entertainment to a form of animal cruelty. Uh, so I really wanna highlight that. But before I do, I wanna go back into the history of the circus. And for those of you know, who know the history of the circus, you know that it did begin as a very innocent form of entertainment and actually began by this man named Philip Astley, or Astley, A-S-T-L-E-Y, not really sure how you pronounce it. Um, but all of my historical information comes from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, if you just search the word circus, it comes up. You know, it's updated on January 18th, so it's very recent information. And Philip Astley um, was in the military in England, but he retired in 1768, and he still had his horse. And so he would get up on his horse, and he would figure out how to stay standing up while riding on his horse's back. And due to centrifugal force, which is just a circle, and you're going around and around, he was able to find that balance, which is actually why a circus is in the form of a circle. Uh, and later, he started adding circus performers and clowns to sort of make a big show of this. And later, one of his students, uh, John Ricketts, brought the, his findings from Europe over to America. He brought it to Philly and he brought it to New York. And eventually, we had all these people bringing exotic animals, these newfound things like uh, tigers and bears and elephants. Oh my. And, <laughs> and um, pretty soon, there's this guy named Barnum who had a circus in New York in the Bronx, and he was very no, well known for his greatest show on earth because of all the new things that he created. He partnered up with Bailey, so Barnum and Bailey created this big circus that really redefined what we know as the circus. And so now that you kind of have a brief history about how animals came in, how it started, how it got to America, I'm gonna talk about how these animals are trained to do such amazing tricks. And um, what I read on an animal law resource center uh, the title of the article was Prohibiting the Exploitation of Animals for Entertainment. It talked about how elephants are treated, and most circus elephants during their time in the circus are chained from their tusks to their feet, and this is because they are so large that trainers need to enforce um, power over them. And then they also have a bull hook that they use, which is a, a rod with a pointy end that they use to sort of jab um, the elephant to make them move or make them perform. And if we hypothetically took a big class field trip to the circus right now, um, right before the elephant took the floor, they, the trainer usually does add a, a couple of jabs to the elephant before going on just to secure and ensure that the elephant will perform to its best abilities. Um, however, the elephant is not the only animal that is treated poorly in the circus. There's also bears and uh, on the academic on file from scholar Suzanne Cataldi. Uh, she went to a Moscow uh, circus one year in 2002, and she was sort of taken back by the outfits that they put the bears in. They put them in like a cuffed, ruffled collar and like tutus and dance costumes, and she was thought that that was very demeaning towards the animal, and it really showed uh, human superiority over the animal. But then further, once the bear actually got into the ring, she noticed that he was, or she, I don't really know, um, was standing on its hind legs. And she thought, you know, how on earth did they, the trainers get the bear to stand like that? And so she did research and she found out that during practice, di different trainers will put hot coals on the floor um, under their front paws and they'll put the circus music in the background. And so they associate the circus music with their front paws being burned. 
And so that's how they get the animal to stand up on its hind legs during the music and circus performances. Another key aspect, now that I've talked about a couple um, sort of training tactics, is transportation of these animals. Because the circus does travel from city to city to city, they take a train, and so all these animals are kind of shoved onto boxcars, even the big animals such as elephants. And because they're chained down, all, all the elef elephants can really do is kind of sway back and forth like this. And it's not really a natural instinct for them. They, you know, they're animals, they need to be walking around and enjoying nature and they can't do that. So their mental state of mind really gets deteriorated, deteriorated while uh, in the circus and traveling like that. Um, however, now that we've talked about all of the historical aspects and the training and the transportation, there are different alternatives to the circus that are very entertaining, one being Cirque du Soleil, which I'm sure, raise your hand if you know someone or you've actually been to circus, Cirque du Soleil before. Wow, so that's a good number of you. And if you've been, I'm sure you can vouch that it's very entertaining. They're well known for their acrobatics, their dance routines, their performances, use of props, and actually they have a story, which is something that doesn't usually happen in the traditional circus. So that's another aspect that could be um, more entertaining. However, if the, um, the animals themselves are really what you're interested in, then I would suggest um, maybe visiting a wildlife sanctuary where circus animals and zoo animals are actually rescued and they're put into a natural habitat where they can thrive more properly. So those are just a couple quick alternatives that you can observe. Uh, I do have a video of Cirque du Soleil. Um, amazing features that they can demonstrate while they perform. So in closing, I just want to re-emphasize that there are more aspects to the circus than just what meets the eye. One, what once was a friendly, sort of innocent form of entertainment of the circus transformed into a form of animal cruelty so that audiences can see that these animals perform tricks. And there are other ways of seeing this sort of entertainment rather than just the traditional circus. So hopefully my speech provided you with some more insight about the behind the scenes aspects of the circus. And as said by a Huffington Post writer, Nancy Collier, we can look past the three rings, beyond the sparkles and the dazzling, dazzling lights to find out what is really true. And hopefully my speech is able to do that for you.